jump in with questions. And I will be stopping periodically too with questions of my own or um, to invite conversation here. So with that said, I'm gonna go ahead and get started here. Um, so first of all, uh, who the heck am I and why should you even listen to me, right? <laughs> So as Lindsay said, I am a communications um, professional. So I actually have training in um, creative writing, photography, and visual communication. Uh, I've been working for over 10 years now. I won't tell you exactly how many years it's been because it's a lot um, in the communications field. And that involves both speaking to the general public. I've given um, well into the hundreds of presentations now. Um, in all sorts of venues, uh, including UPS garages with trucks running in the background, um, and in large companies with uh, many hundreds of people tuning in. So I've even given media interviews. So I have some of that direct experience, but I've also helped um, faculty and students learn how to communicate science and really technical information as well. And the science communication is kind of where I've learned to specialize. So that's just a little bit about me. Um, and then what about your digital self? Like, why should you even care about this? Um, well, the fact is, and as we are all very, very aware of right now, um, digital communication and our digital selves and profiles are really important, especially in this pandemic, right? Um, that's how we communicate with each other. That's how we connect. And with the academic and research community, especially, it's a worldwide community. And you're not going to be chatting with people all across the world in person all the time, right? That's a very rare occasion. So how they're going to interact and see you is really through your digital self. And like it or not, you are probably already out there in the world digitally in some manner. Um, so you might as well curate what people are seeing and how they find you so that you are represented the way you want to be represented online. And a key thing about any communications, and this includes your digital platforms, um, your Twitter accounts, however you are presenting anything, you always want to think about your audience, right? So who are you gearing this communication to? Who are you gearing this page and information to? And who is maybe going to see it? Um, sometimes it's people you aren't maybe intending to see it, but do actually have access to it. So you always want to be thinking about that audience piece that's always important in anything you do. So I'm gonna pause already right here and I just wanna open it up and I wanna to try to tailor my talk a little bit here if I can to any specific questions do you all have or anything you're really hoping to get out of this talk or things that you're just curious about in general. Or things you just hate about digital communication. I'm, I'm willing to hear that too. Hi, Stacey. Um, I feel like it would be really nice to hear about, I think that idea of audience and, and who's there and that a record is out. I feel like it would be helpful to talk about um, like professional versus personal accounts, right? If the personal information is all out there, is it worth it to keep them separate for different audiences? Um, pros and cons of that. I feel like that would be great. That is an excellent point. And it's true, right? Because we use communications, digital communications, especially not only just for our professional lives, right? We use it personally too. So how do you combine the two? Should you combine the two? Is there any um, separation and where that line is? That's a good point. And I'll speak a little bit to that in different platforms, especially. Any other thoughts, questions, ideas? I have a question. Um, this is Jackie. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if there's any drawbacks to having, I know you said that even if you don't have a presence online, you're still out there somewhere, so it's better to curate it. I'm wondering if there's any drawbacks to having like a dearth of information, like if you had a Twitter, but you post very infrequently, or if you have very little information out there, if that's going to be, um, if there's any like harm in doing that. Yeah, so I would say there is actually a little bit of a risk there, right? Um, so it doesn't have to necessarily be Twitter, right? We can all choose different platforms that we want to exist on, but there are, are real risks to not having anything professional out there because A, there probably is something out there that you don't know about, um, about you. And so um, when someone searches for you or is looking for you, 
uh, that might come up and that might be what you don't want them to see about you or the only thing you want them to see about you. Um, and B, if someone, I, they will say that about 70% of employers now do actually search online for their candidates, the people that they're interviewing and looking at, right? And if you don't show up at all, that raises a few bells for people, or they might be looking at the wrong, like, you know, there's a lot of people in the world. There's more than one Stacy Nordstrom in the world, right? So if my information isn't out there and they can't find my information and say, oh yes, this is the right Stacy Nordstrom, they might be looking at the wrong person and getting the wrong information. So there's that risk too. But if you're not on there at all, people are like, okay, why aren't you on there? This is suspicious because in this day and age, most of us are on there somehow, right? So if there's a lot of unanswered questions, right, that starts, people have room to imagine things that maybe aren't true. Hi, Stacey, this is Lindsay. I think you are planning to get to this, but I'd love to hear about pitfalls or big mistakes that you see with academic folks and their social media or their Twitter or their, yeah, just mistakes you see people make, personal website mistakes, things like that. Yeah, okay. I will definitely be sharing a few of those things. And some of them are just more general guidelines or things to watch out for. I do have a few specific examples too. Um, I've tried to uh, use actual real examples for both good and bad things that I do. I don't have as many of the bad ones because I don't, I'm not here to shame anyone, right? I mean, we all make mistakes. All of us are learning all the time. Um, but there are things that you can look out for and that can be common. Um, just little missteps um, that we can all help learn from and avoid. And I will totally uh, open up to for when I'm talking about things, if you have things that you've seen and want to share, right? I think we all have stories. We've all seen things that were like, ooh, I'm not sure if that is what I would have done there. <laughs> so feel free to speak up. I'm not the only one who's seen things here. We all see things online all the time. Okay, I think I'm gonna go ahead and move on. And like I said, if you have thoughts or something comes up along the way, feel free to jump in and ask me. So I'm gonna focus on three big areas here that I think are important for all of us to consider. And I think are ones that are more worth your time um, investment wise. So LinkedIn, uh, yes, it's kind of boring, but uh, it is important. And it is something that is an easy professional presence for you. Um, Twitter, Twitter is, I think, out of all the social media platforms, the one that academically and um, professionally gets used more and might be more useful to you. So if you're going to um, spend any time curating a social media presence, that is the venue I would probably recommend. And then definitely I want to talk a little bit about uh, professional profiles and especially things that are hosted through larger institutions. And in our case, for all of us, this means um, the University of Minnesota and why that's important and why that matters. And I'm going to get right into some nitty gritty details um, and things that kind of applied across all of these platforms. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about is profile photos, right? So this is LinkedIn. This is, if you set up a LinkedIn account, this is going to be your default, right? You get a little gray circle with a little avatar of a head and shoulders, and that's it. And uh, lots of people still have that as their profile photo. Um, and this can be a sensitive topic. I know for a lot of people, um, they're a little hesitant about sharing their image maybe, they feel it's a privacy thing or, you know, sh my image shouldn't matter to my professional, right? Like you're hiring me for my skills, not for how I look, um, which I totally get that. And I'm very sympathetic to that argument. Um, but I do want you to stop and think about it a little bit from another perspective as well, right? Um, the problem with not having a photo is that not having a photo just is the same thing as like, it leaves you wondering, right? And in this day and age, especially with Facebook and Twitter and all these other things, there are bots out there, right? So how do you even know that this is a real thing? So you could be a friendly robot, you could be a menacing, scary robot, 
right? These could be not real profiles is what people are start to think if there's no photo. It just leaves you wondering and it sort of calls into question the authenticity of that. Plus a photo is a nice way to remind you that yes, there's an actual living human being here, right? You can make that connection, that personal trust and connection. So a photo does actually have some benefits and some real uses there. Um, despite I know some people's concerns. Um, and having a photo of you and not a photo of a flower, not a photo of a your favorite teacup or a pretty landscape for your profile photo, that's, I mean, it's a profile photo for a reason. Um, so that's the argument for why you should have a photo. Now, not all photos are created equal. And like I said, these are all real examples um, from people in my LinkedIn network. Um, and again, I, I don't have any names here associated with them. These aren't people that you probably know for the most part. Um, but, and not trying to shame here, but trying to give opportunities to get things to be a little bit stronger or to improve for all of us. So does anyone have any thoughts about this photo and why maybe it might not be an ideal LinkedIn professional photo? Well, someone's got to have some sort of thought, right? It's sort of like a full body shot and he doesn't have a very flattering facial expression. Yeah, so, right? I mean, LinkedIn kind of gives you a little hint there with their avatar. They've got a head and a shoulders, right? This is a full body shot. And the problem is this is um, blown up for you to see more clearly, but on your actual LinkedIn profile, your profile picture is gonna be quite small most of the time, right? So this is a lot happening in a small amount of space and it's not gonna be very clearly read, right? So even though this person is doing something in their professional job, right? This is like a professional type setting, it's an action shot, right? I could see a lot of reasons why they might think this is a good photo for them to have, but really you do wanna focus on this, just that head and shoulders and be really looking at the camera and really looking and sort of into the face of the person who's looking at it. Uh, this is another example. So this one's maybe a little bit better, right? This person's looking into the camera. Uh, they are um, in a professional setting again, right? It's a little bit closer to them. It's not a full body shot. Uh, but there's a few things here that I would avoid too. So this person's wearing a very um, colorful print heavy shirt, right? So that's a little distracting. The bright red uh, tablecloth and flowers are super distracting in the foreground there. It's a little bit fuzzy and backlit. It's a little bit, you can tell it was just snapped at an event, right? So, and that might not be the most professional look that you could present for yourself. And there's a name tag, right? I mean, you know, it's just not quite as polished as it could be. Now this one's getting better, right? So this is a person who has just a plain brick wall in the background, that's a good thing. Um, they're looking directly at the camera, that's a good thing. They're wearing fairly appropriate clothing and everything, it's pretty plain and simple. Um, they have the gopher in there, which is sort of fun because they happen to work, this person happens to work at the University of Minnesota, so it's sort of related. So this is all improvement, but at the same time, right, it's a little bit of a gimmick to have the cutout of the gopher in there and to have your hand around it. It's still a little far away from your actual face, right? You want it to be a little bit more generic. Um, as much as it's fun to show your personality, LinkedIn not, isn't really the place for that and your LinkedIn picture isn't really the place for that. So I'm gonna show you a couple of good examples and reasons why I like them, right? So again, head and shoulders, looking right at the camera, smiling, very simple, plain background, simple, plain top, all good things. Um, this is similar, this is someone who has an outdoor photo, which is totally fine, you can do that too. In fact, I really recommend outdoor photos too because you get some great natural light even especially on cloudy days, right? So you don't have to have a professional photographer take your photo or anything like that and still get a nice um, headshot look. Another nice um, good one, this is also happens to be an outdoor one. This is a workplace setting, but because the background is out of focus, this person happens to be a graphic designer who works digitally 
Um, so it's a lot of elements that really make sense for that position. And again, some just nice, simple backgrounds, professional attire, looking straight at the camera, head and shoulders, good lighting. Um, and I, all of these you'll notice too are not selfies, right? And I know that can be hard, right? We can't all afford professional photographer headshots, right? And you don't need to, but I do encourage if you can get someone else to take the photo for you, you can always tell when it's a selfie and it just doesn't look as nice or polished to use a selfie. Um, this is in a dating profile, right? This is a professional profile photo. So with that, I'm gonna stop talking for a little bit again. Let us breathe a little bit, take that in. Um, any questions or um, tips you wanna know about taking profile photos or any concerns or things you wanna know about photos? Terrible photos you've seen people use? Stacy, do you have a minute to maybe chime in on how to like inject within sort of the confines you've laid out, how to inject personality into these or, th or comments on why one should or should not be concerned about that? Yeah, so in this context, I'm mostly considering um, like a LinkedIn profile photo or maybe a Twitter profile photo. And the problem is it's such a small space and it's gonna be such a small image that really is just an identifier and you want to be clearly seen. I mean, you can still have a little personal style in like how your hair is done or what type of shirt you have, as long as it's not too distracting. Um, your glasses or you know your color choices can be fun and bright. There's nothing against a bright color. It's just the point is the main thing you wanna be able to see is to see the person's face and be able to identify them. Um, and it's a small space. So there's nice ways you can differentiate yourself and show a little more personality in other spaces where you have more room to do that in a thoughtful way. Um, but I would be very careful about getting too gimmicky with your profile photo. Other questions? I have a question, Stacy. Uh, it's Ann Meyer. Um, I've noticed gender differences in headshots, and I don't know if there, if you know of any trends around this or any research on it or anything. What I've noticed is men's headshots look straight at the camera, and women like look over their shoulder or something more more often. And I just wonder about that. Yeah, and I will say it is interesting, and I'm sure there's really interesting research out there. I can't say that I've done a ton of research on that. Um, I will say as a photographer and someone who's been trained in photography, um, it's such a gendered thing, and it's for incredibly superficial, silly reasons, and I don't think they matter. But the reason why photographers often will position people that way is men in a traditional gendered sense like to have those strong shoulders, right, presented. And women tend to like to have that slim profile. It's total crap, honestly. <laughs> and I think I've seen plenty of good female shots with straight shoulders front center looking at it, right? So I don't think it really matters. I think these are just silly, weird conventions that happen to exist in photography that people who take pictures of people end up doing over and over again because that's just what's been done. Um, I don't think that part matters or should matter. What does matter is being professional, looking at the camera, making sure your face is present. Um, so, you know, it's, I think that part is a personal choice, how you want to present yourself or how you want to be seen. And I think, you know, there's no need to, to mimic the gendered type of differences. They exist, it's weird. I don't think it matters. Other questions? I will say if you are a person um, who does wear jewelry or earrings um, or anything like that, um, keep it pretty minimal. Um, you want it to be small. Again, it's more about 
you can have a little personality, but you don't want it to be distracting from your face, right? You as the person is what we most care about in this sort of image. So um, if you are, you can definitely wear jewelry if that is something that you like to do and something that helps express who you are and how you like to dress up. Um, but yeah, just again, just like your top, um, keep it keep it professional and minimal and not distracting. Okay, I think I'm gonna go ahead and move on from that point. Um, there are other images to think about too for these profiles, um, and that includes your background images. Um, and backgrounds sort of have some of the same um, concerns that you want to be thinking about, right? So same thing as like the background of your profile photos, like you don't want it to be too distracting. The whole point is you and then this is a place though where you can send a little bit of personality signaling or uniqueness here. Um, so some things to think about. These ones are for LinkedIn file profiles that I um, have in my networks. Uh, you want to think about the size of the image on the profile. And you can just Google that um, and say, like, what's the size of the background photo for LinkedIn, right? And then you will find what exactly that size is. So you want to choose an image that fits well or will crop well into that space, right? So you don't want something that's going to only show part of it and not make sense in that long, narrow space. So try to choose something that works there. And in this case, this is a really nice, simple one that fits that space. It's pretty minimal. It's got some nice colors. Um, and in this case, this person is a crops researcher. So it's a very appropriate photo related to their field, right, of work that they are in. Another good option is um, to be professional but relevant, right? You could use a photo that uh, alludes to where in the world you're located, right? Or where you work or where you live. Um, in this case, that's what this one does. Again, it has some really nice elements in that it's fairly simple. Um, where the profile photo sits in relative to the background, right? You don't want it covering up something important. So it's just a nice black, a nice blue background. So it's not distracting. Um, but it does give a little hint of where it is or what's important for this person, where they're located. Um, this is a geosciences uh, faculty member. So what's kind of fun about this is, again, it has some nice, cool textures and patterns, but it's overall fairly simple. And in this case, the profile photo has this blue background and the kind of orange of the rocks is a complementary color. So they kind of play off each other a little bit. So the two images work together there. And again, it's relevant to the field without being too distracting um, and still professional looking. This is my personal LinkedIn profile, right? So there's my photo and there's my um, background. In my case, because I am a communications person and it's important for me to use a photo that I've actually taken. Um, there are free photos you can find online that are reusable um, without copyright. Um, there's different ways to find different images um, that you can use for background. Um, in my case, it's important that I use something that is something I've taken. Um, I picked a nice green soft background so it's not too distracting. It picks up a little bit of the color from my shirt that I'm wearing in my profile photo. And it's a lady slipper and that's important because one of the things I love is gardening and flowers and nature. And it also is the state flower of Minnesota, which is where I live and work. So it has some of those different relevant details for me. Um, this is an example of a great Twitter background photo. Um, I'm sure most of you know Rachel Hardman and the type of work that she does. So this is a way to really make a statement too about your work. Um, and I, I would be a little careful about that because you don't want it to be so, so specific. It does need to still be a background and be appropriate for all sorts of communications that you might do. But in this case, I mean, this is really in line with the expertise and the passions um, that this faculty member has and the communications that this faculty member is pushing out and is really timely and relevant too. Um, so you can make some bigger statements here. Um, and it is appropriate too. You just have to make sure you're thinking about those statements and 
who's seeing them and if they are appropriate for what your field and your communications are. And this is an example of a not so good combination for a profile page. This is a LinkedIn page again. Um, the LinkedIn background, the default background is fine. You aren't gonna be, this isn't as important as the profile photo, right? So if you just use the default LinkedIn background, nobody's gonna dock you for that. No one's, it's not gonna not look professional. It's just a way to add a little more personality if you want. So if you wanna leave the plain default one, that's not a bad thing, that's okay. Um, but in this case, this is a person who is a photography faculty member at a university or has been, is an Ameritag now. Um, and their profile photo is terrible, uh, which as a photographer is not a good signal to be sending. Um, they're, they don't even have a background photo. They don't have any example of their work. So when you're in that field, especially that kind of looks, reflects poorly on you. But even if you're not in that field, that's still just not an acceptable background or an acceptable profile photo. And looking at it, it doesn't look professional. It doesn't look like they know what they're doing. Right, and that's a signal that um, anyone who looks at this is gonna get. So, questions about that? Thoughts, feelings? Time for me to take a deep breath. <laughs> Shift around in my seat a bit. Okay, I'm gonna move on a little bit more to away from images, right? I think we kind of hit the highlights there. Um, if you have questions anytime throughout, you know, keep asking me about that, I'm happy to do that. Um, but I'm gonna go back more into the actual content um, and what you're gonna be saying in these different uh, digital bios and things. So for content, you wanna think about a lot of um, different, again, you want to think about the audience that you have for the different venues and then the medium that you're using, right? So what you're doing in LinkedIn is going to be a little different than what you do on, say, Twitter. Um, space and time limitations are all part of that. Um, your LinkedIn is going to be a little bit more like your actual profile page on the university, or at least parts of it will. So a lot of that can go back and forth. And so what you create for one will work well for the other. Um, and then uh, some of that too doubles up with what you put in cover letters or in resumes. Um, so sometimes you can reuse bits of your content. And if you get it really nice looking in one way, you can reuse a lot of that same language in many platforms or many different ways. So the keys are to be concise, to be relevant um, and to be approachable, right? Um, and readable. Uh, you do not want your profiles or anything else that you're doing to be really ridiculously long. You want people to actually read these things, right? <laughs> uh, they want to be short, they have to be relevant, they have to have good impact. Um, you really wanna focus in on your own unique ideas, um, things that make you stand out um, and that are important aspects for your own background, experience, resume, research fields, things like that. Um, you wanna highlight your achievements. I would say generally think three, rule of three is kind of my thing. What are your top three achievements? And then especially for academics, linked to your Google Scholar, right? You don't need to have a whole list of your publications on every profile page or on every LinkedIn. Keep your Google Scholar up to date and just link to that. People know what to expect there. That stays up to date and that way you're not missing 5 million different places where you need to update stuff over time, right? You just highlight the three really key things that are important um, and then have that Google Scholar link in there. And then you can also uh, list um, tools or skills that you have. I think, again, you want to keep it to things that are relevant to your audience or to the platform. So like for LinkedIn, 
you can include some personal things, but I wouldn't spend a lot of time talking about what a great ice skater you are, right? <laughs> or how fantastic you are at jogging because you can have some hobbies and things filled in in some other areas, but you really want to stick to a short list that really highlights your professional skills, right? Do you have coding skills? Do you have statistics skills? Do you have research skills? You know, things that are really relevant to the people who are looking at that LinkedIn list. And you want to keep it to a short bullet point list, right? You don't want big blocks of text because, again, no one's going to bother to spend the time to read that. People skim and look at things quickly. And this kind of applies both for LinkedIn and for Twitter or social media accounts or things that you're using. Um, you really do want to avoid jargon. And I know this can be hard for scientists um, because there is so much very technical language in the research and work that you do. Um, but you will show your mastery of your technical language in your publications, in your work samples, in those specific examples of what you can do, right? In your bio, in your little short messages on Twitter, you really want it to be approachable to a larger audience um, and to many different types of people because you'll be talking to your audience really will include people that are not specialists in your particular area. Even if they're in your field, they might not be particularly specialists in the exact area that you have spent a lot of time researching in. So that matters. But also, if you think about it, a lot of times an HR person is doing some screening ahead of time, right? And if they don't understand or it doesn't seem to make sense to them, that could be a bad thing. So you really want to keep it appropriate and relevant, yes, to your field and professional, but also try to really think about, do I really need to use this specific technical jargon language here or not? Be really thoughtful about that. And then also try to avoid those buzzwords. Um, this is something that I see a lot of people are like, oh, I have to put in all these buzzwords. So I come up in these searches and in these different search terms. And that's how people are going to find me and really associate me with all this great stuff. The fact of the matter is, A, that's just not true. And B, for the type of careers and um, pathways that you're looking at, right, most likely there's not going to be a recruiter who is searching LinkedIn to find your profile to hire you and offer you a job that way. That's not how people are going to find you. You're going to be applying for jobs or you're going to be submitting applications or doing things right. Um, so they're not finding you through a metadata search, right? You're actually, they're searching you out specifically and seeing what you have um, through a different resource. And also like throwing a bunch of words in there that don't actually mean anything doesn't help, right? You always want to more show rather than tell. So instead of saying, you know, I am a great inventive person. I'm an inventor who works hard and um, has great vision. Like, okay, what does that mean? Can't anyone say that? Instead, actually show examples of like an actual new idea you came up with, or here's a really interesting research project that I helped work up and come up with, or here's a blog post that I helped write. Um, you know, things like that. You really want to have specific examples that back up what you're saying, right? You don't want to just be all flowery language with no substance. So I'm going to pause here again um, and really ask if you have any questions or thoughts, things you want to know more about in that kind of area. Hi, Stacey. Um, this is Meg. I had a quick question um, regarding linking to other profiles. You talked specifically about linking to your Google profile. Is it important to set like one main external profile to link all your other social media accounts to? And that should that be your Google profile or should you link to, for example, your MPC page on both your your Twitter account and your LinkedIn account? Do you have any guidance as which to select? 
So um, what I was actually talking about, I think there earlier was Google Scholar. So if, like for publication specifically, um, but yes, it is also helpful sometimes to just link to a main profile. So um, you can choose whatever that is. I would say, and I'll talk a little bit more about this. Um, while you are at the U, I would definitely fill out your um, university-based profile page like the one on the MPC website um, for a couple of reasons. A, you can have a lot of those really relevant professional details in there. Um, B, it looks like a nice clean website. It gets updated and checked and secured regularly through the university. And uh, C, it automatically grants you legitimacy, right? So the University of Minnesota is a very well-known institution, right? Uh, they have a good reputation. And just by being associated with that, having your information and your image associated with all of the faculty, all of the researchers, um, the institution validation, that just having a page there can signal is really big, right? So instead of just having your own personal website, like that could be made by anybody, who cares, no one's vetted that. Right, this is a institutionally approved. Yes, you are actually associated with this. Yes, you are legitimate. Yes, you are actually a student or a scholar or a researcher or a faculty member here, right? So, um, you know, go ahead and use that resource. It's at your fingertips. Use it, do it, right? Um, if you don't, for some reason, have a professional profile page at a, your workplace or an institution, um, LinkedIn is always a good one because it is, again, standard. Lots of people accept it or know about it. It's a good thing to have anyway, and it can have all that basic information you really need to have. So that would be my backup one, would be LinkedIn. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, I think someone's trying to talk, but it got a little choppy. Can you try again, please? Sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry, Jesse. Your microphone doesn't seem to be working correctly, but I think I caught maybe some of it. Maybe you're asking about um, if you're someone who's changed careers, who did a different job in the past and is now doing something new. Is that right? Maybe use the chat box if your mic isn't working. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so yeah, career changes can be uh, a big deal, right? Sometimes you're in a whole new field than you used to be. Um, I think it's still important to recognize what your past career is because there are skills and resources that you can highlight through there, right? You might need to think about it in a different way um, or to show that you have been doing something. Obviously you wanna focus more on what your current trajectory is and what your skills and relevance, relevant details are there. But um, it is worth also further down acknowledging like, yes, this was the job I had before and here are some relevant skills or key things I learned to take away from that, right? Because even if it's a completely unrelated field, you're still learning problem solving skills, you're still learning relationship skills, you're still learning communication skills, you're still using parts of that development from your past, even if it's not a technical skill that applies to your current career maybe. Um, so I think that's, it's not a bad thing to have, right? And I think people are more aware and accepting of career changes now than they used to be, right? I mean, it's not as unusual to see. And I think um, part of that too is that, that question mark, right? So if you have a big, huge blank space in your timeline, people are gonna wonder, okay, well, what happened there? What, what's in that space there? So I think there's always a 
it's always better to be a little transparent and curate that space rather than to just leave it blank and leave it open to somebody's imagination because you can't you can't predict what they're going to imagine there if you just leave it open to interpretation. Okay, great. So I just want to touch briefly on networking and using these spaces for networking. Um, networks are helpful and important. I will say don't expect that just because you have not have a large number of connections on LinkedIn that a job is going to fall into your lap, right? That's not going to happen. <laughs> Realistic expectations here. Um, but um, if you do have larger networks, you never know what um, opportunities might arise for collaborations or um, references or connections that might help you professionally, knowledge you can skill share, things like that. Plus it just looks good when someone comes to look at like say your LinkedIn profile that, oh, they do have connections. They're not just like, just created this and then haven't done anything with it. Um, so I think realistic expectations and just leveraging what already exists there for you. Um, and especially thinking about that professional end of it, right? So go ahead and um, try to add your professors or your peers who are on this call here or staff members at um, the MPC. They can always just say no, right? They can always turn the application down. But a lot of times they'll say yes because it doesn't hurt them either to have a larger following or larger number of people that they're connected to. Um, go ahead when you go to conferences and things like connect with the speakers at conferences or other people that you admire in the field. Um, again, you're really curating that professional space. Um, you can have some friends as connections, right? That's a that's an okay thing too, as long as you know they're fairly. I mean, uh, yeah, you can have friend connections too, but again, you're thinking about it in a more professional sense here. Um, and I'm really talking about both LinkedIn, right? You can really do that on LinkedIn, um, but also Twitter. Um, and so, especially with Twitter. Uh, like if you go to a conference, they almost always have a hashtag for that conference or hashtags for the fields that you're in. So like if that's um, different social science hashtags, you can kind of look around in whatever field your research is in. There's usually some sort of hashtag in there. So you can follow those hashtags or use those hashtags. Um, and really follow people who are experts in that field or who are conference goers. And like when you go to a conference, if you use that hashtag and participate in that conversation, right? It's a really good way to network and be part of that conversation in a way that you wouldn't be able to even when you are in person, you can't talk to everybody, you can't be seen by everybody, but everyone who's active on Twitter and is using that hashtag We'll look at that hashtag and we'll see a whole bunch of tweets. And if you're part of that conversation, that's a great way to get some visibility there. And then thinking about your networks too. So this is a little bit where that professional personal divide comes in and where that line is and where that line should be, right? So LinkedIn, it's a little less confusing because LinkedIn is exists solely for and was created really as a professional space, right? You're not doing your socializing on LinkedIn, let's be honest. <laughs> so that one's a little bit clear, right? So it it's not so confusing there. Twitter can be a little bit or other social media platforms can be a little bit more difficult. Um, and I'll get into a little bit why I specifically am referencing Twitter. So uh, part of my job is actually managing social media accounts and knowing the different audiences of different social media accounts. And the big ones here still really are Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, right? And professionally, um, Facebook tends to skew older, um, tends to skew a little bit more informal, more personal. And that's like a space for people like me who work in um, 
academic settings, that's like how we connect with alumni or people who really care about the gophers and you know alumni pride and things like that. It's not really so much a communication tool for research as much. There's a little bit of that, but not as much. Um, Twitter is really where journalists tend to be, where policymakers tend to be, and where a lot of that social and science communication tends to be live. Um, and this is probably not news for a lot of you. You, a lot of you probably already recognize that. Um, so Twitter is really the bigger one. And some of you might have personal Twitter accounts that are more geared to your own personal interests that are not maybe so professional. And you can have more than one Twitter account, right? Um, but I would encourage you to use Twitter in mostly a professional sense. Um, and especially have a Twitter account that has your actual name and your actual image um, professionally, because Twitter is also largely public. There are some ways to make things more private, but generally speaking, if you put it on Twitter, I would assume that it is public for everyone to see. And so I really would encourage using that space very professionally and thoughtfully. Um, you can include personal things, right? And especially, actually, I encourage faculty members who become experts and do a lot more public communication to feel free to include a little bit of personality and personal details in there that you're comfortable sharing in a very public manner um, because it humanizes you, right? So. Um, as much as we all love data and we all love factual information and science, right? That personal um, human connection is how people really process and understand things. Um, so it's a really great way to connect with people in your audience. Um, so sharing personal details and personal things that you like are, are actually good things for science communications and for building trust and that connection with your audience. Um, but keep in mind that it is also going to be seen by maybe your boss or I always try to think too, like, since I work for a university, like what if the governor called me into his office and was looking at a tweet that I had posted? Like, would I be okay explaining that tweet? Would I be stumbling there? Would it be really awkward and I feel embarrassed about it, right? So you always wanna think to a higher level of like, oh, what if a reporter got this tweet and shared it? How is that gonna look for me, right? Me, cause they're not all gonna know all the context, right? So you have to really be thoughtful, I think with that and with that personal connection and sharing. Um, and you definitely retweet and, and share information from people, um, especially, like I said, people you admire, research professionally, academically, um, really important conversations that are happening. Um, don't be afraid to be involved in conversations that are maybe, or to um, share information on things that are maybe a little controversial, right? So I'm not saying don't do things like that, especially if it's relevant to your research and things that you are confident in taking a stand on and standing by. Um, for instance, I used to run the social media account for the Department of Soil, Water and Climate. And uh, anyone who has done anything climate science wise knows that it can get really heated, but that doesn't mean you stay out of it, right? Because that is where our research is. That is really important to us. We do have a stand to take and we're not afraid to take it there, right? So it's okay to do those types of things. Um, just make sure that you really are confident and um, secure in the stand that you are taking and why you're taking that stand, right? Um, what I would discourage is any large political rants, right? Don't get personal, don't get nasty, you know, just general kind things. You wanna think still professionally when you're taking um, stances on issues. And then just a word of warning, Twitter and social media can be a bit of a black hole, right? It can be this huge giant time suck. 
Um, and it's easy to get lost in it, right? Because yeah, it just is, it's endless. You can scroll forever and be retweeting and sharing information forever. But keep in mind the person, the larger perspective, right? So you can do all this window addressing and do all this communication, but the goal isn't to have the most active Twitter account in the world. The goal isn't to have, I am the best Twitter person in my field. I've got the most tweets. I've got the most communication out there, right? Because that at the end of the day is sort of the facade, right? And if there's nothing of substance to back it up, people are gonna see through that very quickly, right? The most important thing is your own research, your own work, your own professional skills. Um, so that has to come first, always. Um, so you can tweet occasionally. You can use Twitter only for conferences. You can do it very minimally. There's not, there's not really a disadvantage to having only a little bit on Twitter or not being super active on Twitter, right? It still exists. People can find you. They can still say, oh, this is a real person and this is their research and this is who they are, right? It still exists without having, you don't need to tweet every day. You don't need to even tweet every week if you don't have time to do that or don't want to do that, right? So having a little something on there is fine and okay. You don't have to invest tons of time into this if you don't want to or don't have time to. Stacy, just want to quickly jump in and let you know we have about five more minutes. Okay. I will wrap up here really quick. I'm almost done anyway. So again, I talked about this a little bit, but go ahead, look at your um, website on the MPC page, your professional site, right? Make sure you have a good photo on there. Make sure your contact information is on there make sure your bio makes sense and is really up to date. And use that information on your LinkedIn, use that information in many different ways. It's an easy, quick win for you. And like I said, it grants you that legitimacy. Um, this is what you don't want. This is an example where it's just the basic, there you have an email and one little short line that doesn't tell you anything, right? That's, that's not, making the full use of a great resource you have available to you for free. And then there are mistakes you can make, right? So I'm gonna just stop here now since we're almost out of time and open it up in for questions or um, anything you guys have that you wanna know about mistakes or things that go awry or things that you really wanna know about here. Anybody send an email that they didn't mean to send? I was sharing a tip the other day that uh, I personally use. The very last thing I do when I send an email is to put in the um, actual email address of who it's sending to, right? I leave that two spot blank until I'm completely done and ready to send it. That way, I, there's no accidental, oops, I didn't, wasn't ready to send that, or oops, that went to the wrong person, or, right, leave that to the very end. There's a couple questions in the chat, Stacy. Okay. One about a personal website, and if you think folks should have those, and one about common mistakes that people seem to make on these platforms. Yeah, so personal websites. Um, that is something I don't generally recommend at this stage for most people um, because a personal website is a lot of effort, right? So it takes, you have to make it look professional. You have to keep it updated. It's another thing that you have to make sure is constantly on your radar. Um, you have to host it somewhere. Um, you have to do graphics. I mean, it's a lot of work and it's not a lot of return for that work, right? People are looking for you on LinkedIn. People are looking for you on Twitter. They're not looking for your own website. So maybe when you're very well established and you have a lot of things that you want to host on your own and you're really committed and have the time to keep it up, sure, then have a personal website. Um, but for the most part, it's not enough bang for your buck time-wise. 
Um, common mistakes everyone seems to make. Uh, getting too cutesy with stuff, right? Trying to think you're really funny, but you're really not online, right? Um, yeah, uh, just be careful with those little profile things or just leaving stuff um, blank, right? Uh, creating stuff and then not bothering to do anything with it. Um, so if you, it's, it's good to have things at least minimally filled out and thoughtfully filled out. If you just leave things oddly blank, it, everyone knows it. <laughs> so, you know, spend the time to make it at least look, get the basics down, right? But yeah, I think a lot of people think, you know, oh, I can make this really funny joke and it just doesn't land with a lot of your audience. And yeah, I, I see that a lot. Other I'll chime in to note that like, and Stacy and I will frequently, like if we're talking about stuff on Twitter, we'll like run it by each other. Or sometimes I'll ask random people. I'll say like, do you understand this? And like, you get the blank stares and you're like, no. Okay, cool. We've gone too far. Like other people are a really good gauge yeah. on that. We were, we saved ourselves from a will it blend gif that we both found very funny by asking other people for feedback. <laughs> Yeah, I will say I have a lot of preventative measures in there and having someone else, I like a family member or a friend or another colleague or another student, you know, to take a look like, does this make sense? Does this work for you or not? Like that's smart. And then I will say too, there's a difference too between a personal professional social media account and a business account like Wendy's. I don't know if people have seen Wendy's Twitter. They can be sassy and funny, right? But that's a company and a persona that's taken on by that company, right? This, you as a person have to be your personal professional persona and that's you, right? So that is different than, I would say even the Ippens account can be a little bit snarkier than I would be personally on my own professional mm -hmm. account, right? So they're different things. Don't take your cues from companies. And you also can't edit a tweet, which is also right. something to note. You could, you could delete it, but you can't edit it after the fact. So, all right, Stacy, any last final words before we close for the day? Um, my only final words here are just feel free to contact me. I'm always happy to look over a presentation, um, to look over your profile, your bio, or if you have any questions at all, use me as a resource. That's part of my job. That's why I'm here. It's one of the things I really like to do is I'm here to help. I'm happy to be a sounding board. I'm happy to help answer any questions you have. So really, honestly, feel free to reach out to me. Thank you so much, Stacey. Thank you for ending it like that. And uh, thanks everyone for joining us for our final workshop this fall semester. We will see you again in January. Thanks so much. Have a great weekend. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Stacey.